Good afternoon. I'm Derek Douglas with the White House Domestic Policy Council. I want to welcome you to the Neighborhood Revitalization Initiative web chat. I want to start by thanking our partner, Next American City. And we're really looking forward to having a lively um, discussion and conversation among the agencies that are here today. Um, the Neighborhood Revitalization Initiative is one of our signature place-based initiatives in the White House Urban Policy Team. And we're excited about the collaboration and the integration that is happening among these agencies, which is really being spearheaded by the cabinet secretaries who lead these agencies. Um, for those of you who don't know, the initiative was launched on September 21 when the promised neighborhood planning grant announcements were made. And so we'll get into the details today about how the initiative works, what some of the goals and expectations are, and answering your questions. Um, also, for those of you who are watching, if you want to ask a question live, you can go to whitehouse.gov slash live, and then you'll find a link that will connect you to the web chat. Um, we're going to start by having each of our agency partners introduce themselves and briefly talk about the role that their agency is playing in the Neighborhood Revitalization Initiative. And we'll start with Larkin Tackett from the Department of Education. Thanks, Larkin. Derek. I'm Larkin Tackett. I'm the Deputy Director at the U.S. Department of Education for the Promise Neighborhoods Program. Um, at the Department of Education, we really believe that we need to educate ourselves to a better economy. And Promise Neighborhoods is really a key part of the Neighborhood Revitalization Initiative because we truly believe that we need a great school at the center of every great neighborhood. Next, we'll hear from Thomas App, uh, uh, Department of Justice. Uh, thank you, Derek. Uh, very happy to be here. My name is Thomas Apt. I'm Chief of Staff at the Office of Justice Programs, working for Assistant uh, Attorney General Lori Robinson with the Department of Justice. And we, uh, and we are running the Byrne Criminal Justice Innovation Program. Uh, we're very happy to be here with our partners at Education, HUD, HHS, and the White House. Uh, we feel that this collaboration is very important. Uh, with reference to the Department of Justice, uh, I think that public safety is a critical component of neighborhood revitalization. Without it, um, kids can't learn, um, residents can't feel safe in their home or neighborhoods, and residents' neighbor health is threatened by either drugs or violence. Uh, so we hope to uh, be a critical component, really, uh, really protecting the important gains that these other signature initiatives can make for neighborhoods. Thanks, Thomas. Um, next, we'll hear from Luke Tate at HUD. Hi, I'm Luke Tate. I work as Special Assistant to Secretary Sean Donovan at HUD. Uh, HUD's incredibly excited to be part of the Neighborhood Revitalization Initiative. We understand that concentrated poverty uh, has a devastating effect on families and communities. And the fact that uh, simply uh, the zip code that a child uh, grows up in can have such an incredible uh, and powerful influence over their chances in life, uh, we think is just unacceptable. So we're incredibly excited uh, to bring a new program to bear, Choice Neighborhoods. Uh, uh, Choice Neighborhoods builds on 17 years of success with Hope Six, uh, taking the very best uh, lessons that we've learned in communities all around the country. Uh, there's probably a Hope Six project in your community and we've taken those very best lessons and built them into a new program uh, called Choice Neighborhoods that broadens our focus, uh, moving beyond just public housing, indeed moving beyond the walls of the development itself uh, to the entire neighborhood uh, to address the uh, educational needs, uh, the economic development needs, and the housing needs of those communities uh, so that we really get to a point where you no longer can accurately predict a child's negative outcomes uh, or path in life simply by the zip code uh, that they grow up in. Thanks, Luke. And finally, we'll hear from Richard Frank from the Department of Health and Human Services. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Richard Frank. I'm the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation at the Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, I think what we're hearing today is uh, what our secretaries recently stated at the uh, kickoff of the Promise Neighborhood Program, which is that where you live matters, and it matters a lot, that community resources are critical to uh, how well uh, people uh, live their lives, and that um, uh, health, uh, behavioral health, and child care uh, are all critical components uh, in building the well-being of our communities. 
Terrific. Um, before we start in with the questions, I also just want to recognize that the one agency who's also part of the Neighborhood Revitalization Initiative, Treasury, um, couldn't be with us this afternoon, but they are also a critical partner in this effort. Um, so we're going to start with the questions, and we got a series of questions um, from our partners at Next American City. And the first one I want to direct to Thomas. This is a question that comes from Matthew De Ferranti, and he asks, I would like to know first how much more than promised neighborhoods goes into the White House's Neighborhood Revitalization Initiative? And second, what metrics are you using to assess success of the initiative? Thomas? Uh, thanks, Derek, and uh, thank you, Matthew. Uh, it's a good question. Um, the neighborhood revitalization eff uh, effort is much broader uh, than uh, just Promise Neighborhoods, although I have to say Promise Neighborhoods is a signature part of the program and very important, as is uh, Choice Neighborhoods uh, as well. Um, but the Neighborhood Revitalization Initiative is really a way uh, for federal agencies and the executive branch to really do better in terms of working together to deliver results for the American people. And we're trying to do that by focusing on specific places and then really coordinating our efforts and our resources uh, in those specific places. And those are neighborhoods in distress uh, for this particular program. Uh, the participants uh, currently are the Department of Justice, obviously Department of Education, Housing and Urban Development, and uh, Health and Human Services, as well as Treasury. Uh, the initiative may, as we progress, uh, include additional partners. In fact, we hope it does. Um, in terms of metrics, uh, that's an excellent question. Uh, to do an initiative like this, you have to have a comprehensive set of uh, metrics because you're trying to affect comprehe uh, comprehensive change. So, for, and uh, the way that we've approached this is that every agency has a separate set of outcomes that it prioritizes and that it frankly knows a lot about. So for the Department of Justice, those would be uh, violent crime rates. Uh, rates of drug use, um, uh, signs of urban disorder. Uh, for ed education, it might be high school graduation rates or rates of college completion, another academic achievement. Uh, for housing, it might be measures of housing quality. And for HHS, it might be rates of healthcare access in uh, distressed communities. So what we're trying to do in this initiative is make sure that the way we measure results uh, really is consistent with the overall comprehensive approach. And so uh, we hope to have a broad set of metrics. And we're, in fact, sharing all these metrics and including them in our solicitations or NOFOs or requests for proposals as we move forward. Thanks, Thomas. Um, the second question I'm going to direct to Larkin. And as I mentioned at the top, when the Neighborhood Revitalization Initiative was launched, it was part of the Promise Neighborhoods announcement, announcement, which is a signature initiative of President Obama, one that he talked about when he was on the campaign trail, and really, a, a, I think, a crowning achievement for the Department of Education and its approach to holistic um, education. The question it comes from Timothy Carton Geeves from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And the question is, what lessons can be learned by previous failed attempts at, quote unquote, urban renewal? And to what extent can promised neighborhoods repair damage and avoid pitfalls? Larkin. Great. So another good question. I think in general, we would recognize that promised neighborhoods really stand on the shoulder of, um, uh, or stand on the shoulders of lots of work and lots of leaders in local communities um, who, be, who have been working for years to break the cycle of poverty. Um, that being said, I think there are some important uh, defining carrot characteristics of promised neighborhoods. If you compare this initiative to previous comprehensive neighborhood revitalization um, initiatives. And I think the first characteristic that's different is that there's a clear expectation that there should be a great school at the center of every neighborhood. Um, and secondly, that there really does need to be uh, a cradle to career focus on uh, improving the outcomes of kids. 
Um, secondly, Promise Neighborhoods was actually very explicit in um, its application process and asked communities to identify their lessons learned. And so in their previous work, years of experience, what have they learned about working with schools? What have they learned about uh, braiding funding sources? What have they learned about working with local governments? Um, we, we asked them to identify that in their application with the hopes that they could actually avoid some of those pitfalls that folks experienced in the past. Um, and then finally, uh, as Thomas alluded to before, uh, Promise Neighborhoods is really focused on a core set of results. So the bottom line, uh, the question that we'll ask ourselves as a department, um, as a program, is are we achieving uh, a core set of results for children and families? Um, and I think what this program, Promise Neighborhoods recognizes and what the Neighborhood Revitalization Initiative broadly recognizes is those core set of results are comprehensive. Um, and the obstacles that children face when they go to school every day um, are not just educational obstacles, but they're ob obstacles in their housing situation um, and the fact that many um, communities are just not safe enough or the fact that they're coming to school with a myriad of health challenges. So what Promise Neighborhoods really does um, and what the Neighborhood Revitalization Initiative recognizes is that, they, is that we really have to focus on that broad set of results in order to significantly uh, improve outcomes for kids and to revitalize neighborhoods. Terrific. Uh, the next question comes from Karen Beck Pooley from Allenton, Pennsylvania, Allentown, Pennsylvania. Um, her question is, and I'm going to direct this to Luke, and it, the other panelists, if you want to jump in, you, you feel free to, although the first couple were kind of um, specific to your agencies. My main concern is how to translate housing dollars um, into neighborhood-wide outcomes, such as improved quality of life, increased investment, improved perceptions about a neighborhood's current condition and future potential, and et cetera. How will this new initiative do that? Uh, this is a really good question. Yeah. Um, thank you, Karen, for the question. Uh, as I was talking about with Hope 6, uh, HUD has for 17 years run a program called Hope 6 that's rebuilt some of the most distressed public housing uh, all around the country. Uh, folks remember uh, in the 90s, uh, the Cabrini Greens, the Robert Taylor Homes. Uh, the, the success that we've had in specific communities with Hope 6 uh, has been, I think, in everybody's mind, uh, something to be proud of. Uh, but too often, these Hope 6 programs, they're really uh, or these Hope 6 developments too often are islands of hope, uh, but in a sea of need. The, the neighborhood outside uh, the walls of the project uh, hasn't always changed. And in the very best places it has, and it's been because the people who are, who are pursuing that redevelopment of that community were doing it with the community members, uh, and they were pursuing more than just a housing shift. Uh, they were ensuring that the kids who were growing up in that community, uh, they had a, a chance at a decent education. Uh, they were ensuring that uh, economic development uh, dollars were flowing into the community at the same time that the housing was being rebuilt to make it a, an attractive place for private companies to invest. That's what we're doing now through Choice Neighborhoods. We give every local community uh, who wins one of these grants the tools and the flexibility uh, to take that money, uh, rebuild the housing, the public housing, the assisted housing, but also uh, to focus on uh, connecting uh, the people who live in that community to transit, for example. Uh, or if it's a, a community that's in a food desert, if they don't have access to uh, healthy or even fresh food, all there is is the corner store with nachos. Uh, they can uh, use the flexibility of the Choice Neighborhoods money uh, to bring a grocery store into that community. Uh, we think that that's the kind of flexibility that every local community needs, but we think it comes with a, a promise which is that every kid growing up in those developments has to have a shot at a high quality education. And that's how, that's in large part how we'll be choosing uh, the grantees. So we wanna ensure that every community is focused not just on the housing development itself, but everything it takes to ensure that the residents uh, of that development and of the community as a whole uh, really do have changed outcomes and changed opportunities in life. I would just add that, you know, to, the, to this question, um, more broadly on the neighborhood revitalization uh, initiative, um, I don't think, uh, I think uh, Promise um, and Choice uh, make, a, you know, great strides in terms of this comprehensive community-based approach, but it's not sort of, I think, ultimately uh, realistic to expect 
through one program exactly. or through another uh, that you're going to affect this uh, comprehensive community-wide change. These are great starts, but that's why we all need to work together. Yeah. Um, and that's what we're hoping to do through this initiative. So, you know, HUD uh, will, uh, I assume, you know, be making its best efforts to, to affect these community-wide changes, but they need justice's help. They need education's help. They need HHS's help. I think it's important to be specific. I mean, I hope the folks who are watching today have a chance to go check out the White House blog post uh, Melody Barnes put up last week. There's a long description of everything that we're doing in this neighborhood revitalization initiative. One of the things we talk about is figuring out how in communities that have the need and the capacity uh, to do choice neighborhoods, but then to also have uh, a public, uh, uh, public safety uh, intervention. Uh, the Department of Justice is putting forward uh, so that uh, not only do you increase the likelihood of success on both fronts, but you create the conditions for that neighborhood to really change. Uh, and it's because of this initiative uh, that we've been able to do that. So I really hope folks are able to check that out. Any other um, people want to jump in? Okay, thanks for that question. The next question I'm going to direct to you, Richard, and um, it comes from Michael Shaw from Baltimore, Maryland. And Michael asked, and this is the next American City question. Um, he asked, beyond NOFA match and leverage, what is the role of philanthropy in this neighborhood revitalization strategy? Uh, uh, thanks very much for the question, uh, Michael. Um, I think that, uh, you know, at its heart, the philosophy of the uh, neighborhood revitalization program is about mobilizing community resources. And so uh, uh, a key resource is uh, uh, private philanthropy, and so we view it as a critical building block. Uh, perhaps an example might be uh, useful. Uh, we have at HHS a uh, strong, um, now somewhat longstanding collaboration with uh, um, our colleagues at HUD. Mm -hmm. And one of the um, things we're working on very uh, uh, energetically right now is uh, putting together housing with services for elders and uh, planning uh, how to do that. And what we've been doing is from the very start, we've been reaching out to foundations, we've been holding uh, meetings with uh, industry and bringing the foundations in uh, so that they are actively engaged in our conversation about how best to do this. And I think that serves as a model for the kinds of ways, uh, at least we at HHS, and I know my colleagues at HUD, uh, uh, see uh, bringing foundations uh, into the um, activities of the, of the initiative. And I would just add that uh, in addition to philanthropy, I think there's a clear, um, uh, a clear theme in the neighborhood revitalization initiative is that the federal role is really as a catalyst. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're providing you know, what is a relative small amount of money um, in, in uh, a targeted set of communities to really catalyze a comprehensive approach. Um, and that really recognizes the idea that um, uh, communities need local foundations to step up to the table, um, as well as local and state governments. Even in a time of declining resources, um, we've got to think outside of the box in terms of how we fund and start these initiatives, but also um, how to sustain them over the long term. So, so it really does take um, you know, a comprehensive approach, but a comprehensive set of partners and funders uh, in order to make these programs work and to sustain over time. Um, so I'm going to, we have a question here, it's kind of long, that came in through the live web chat, and I'm going to kind of throw it open um, to folks. It, it kind of relates to what you just said, Larkin, about how we're trying to put this initiative together um, with not a huge amount of dollars. The, question, the questioner was David Phillips. I don't know where he's from. But he essentially asked, the government has thrown trillions of dollars over the decades at the problem of distressed neighborhoods. Yet across the board, we still see crime, low graduation rates, unemployment, et cetera. And things sometimes seem to be getting worse. Why are you all continuing this, what he calls a failed policy, um, which I think, to paraphrase, is throwing a bunch of money at the problem? Or how is this different from that? Well, I think, I think one key difference, quite frankly, is that we're all sitting at the same table. So I think for years, 
Um, you know, we have worked in silos at the federal level, uh, and quite frankly, we have forced local governments and local communities to work in the same silos because we have provided our funding um, in different ways with different requirements. And I think what we're doing now is saying that that way of doing business has got to stop. Um, you know, we have for too long not addressed the the reality that communities of concentrated poverty have a comprehensive set of challenges and we need, and we need to think comprehensively about how to address them. And we need to stop, um, once and for all, creating obstacles to um, communities to do that work in an integrated way. So um, we're actually not throwing trillions of dollars at the problem in this program. It is a, a relatively small amount of money, but we uh, are starting the process of doing work differently and allowing more flexibility for communities to really focus on uh, the broad set of challenges um, that, that face low-income neighborhoods. Um, can I just build on, yeah. upon that? I, I mean, I think it's important to sort of address questions like that because they sort of, they sort of fundamentally uh, sort of signal that people are sort of troubled about sort of the general ability of government to do this kind of work. And I think it's important to really answer that directly. Uh, I think that you know there are, over the over the past you know decade, two decades, three decades. There's been lots of programs that do or don't work, and we're uh, exploring new ways of doing business in order to do better. But there are programs that have worked and been very effective. And I think that when you're doing this kind of work, one of the things that we need to do in order to serve you best is really. Uh, look at this objectively and say, what's worked in the past? If it's worked in the past, how can we build upon it? And if it hasn't worked in the past, let's move on. And you know, from the criminal justice perspective, uh, since the uh, since the mid '90s, we've had continued decreases in violent and other crime. Uh, the UCR, uh, the FBI Unified Crime Rate reports. Uh, just came out a few weeks ago, and they reported even in a time of economic downturn, crime is still down, including violent crime. Uh, and one of the and one of the things and we don't know exactly what's driven this, but one of the things I think we can say is that the uh, is that effective policing, effective community-based approaches, um, effective partnering, and and gathering the sort of community's moral outrage at gang violence or drug-infested neighborhoods has been effective. Is it the entire story? I don't think we know that for sure. But we know that good work, uh, and, and more importantly, supporting good local work at the federal level can have results. Great. Thanks for that question. Um, the, um, the next question I'm going to direct is to Richard. Um, the question comes from Diana Lind in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And this is the next American City question. A program like the Harlem Children's Zone works because of its long-term connection with the people and place of a very specific community. While it's one model of how to change a neighborhood, a lot of communities need to see short-term results. How will this initiative balance short-term and long-term programs and goals? Uh, well, that, that, that's a terrific question, and uh, it's, it's a challenging question. Um, we're, uh, we're poised at an actually very important and interesting time, which is um, we are uh, launching this initiative at the same time that um, uh, we're implementing the Affordable Care Act, or our national health reform. And uh, that creates uh, some opportunities. Um, we're going to go through a period where we uh, uh, dramatically expand uh, coverage uh, uh, for, uh, against uh, uh, health care needs. And um, that uh, focus will be particularly uh, on the Medicaid program, where we are going to uh, expand insurance coverage for uh, large numbers of low-income, vulnerable populations. Uh, so I think that will immediately start to change people's uh, ability to access quality health care. At the same time, we're taking measures to improve the delivery of health care, and in particular starting to um, bring uh, um, sort of the best that science knows 
uh, new ways to communities. And for example, there is uh, a strong new initiative uh, for bringing um, home visitation uh, services uh, to uh, families with young children and uh, newborns. And that uh, has been shown to uh, really improve uh, longer term outcomes and learning uh, in children. And that is just an example of the kinds of new uh, initiatives that should start to get uh, pretty quick results and also pretty quick connections between uh, the community's institutions and its populations. If I could add yeah. just a little bit to that. I think Richard's uh, dead on. You know, Diana, you, you talked about the Harlem Children's Zone. I think you know, those who have spoken with uh, Jeff Canada and his amazing team there, uh, they know that this kind of neighborhood change, ho you know, holistic neighborhood change, does take time. Uh, there aren't shortcuts. Uh, but you're exactly right. Uh, there are things that have to change uh, immediately, and there are things that can change. Uh, it, you know, when the quality of the school and the community changes in a matter of years, that's a change that matters to the kids in that community. When crime drops uh, because of a, a community that's united, uh, in a common effort ag against crime, that's a change that matters in that community. Uh, you know, when housing is torn down, that has been vacant, uh, that drug dealers have been using as a base of operations, uh, and new housing is built up on that block, that's a change for that community. And, and those are the types of things that can happen on a very short-term scale. Uh, while it's true that uh, changing uh, an entire neighborhood in the long term uh, does take time. Um, let's go to a a question from the live audience now, and I'll ask um, Larkin from your Promised Neighborhoods experience and, and, um, and others can jump in. The question, let me find out who it's, the, the name of the person who put it in. Um, I think it's Joe Manzella. And he asks, how do we begin coordinating the local element of this process? Um, he uses MPOs as an example. MPOs are often the de facto regional planning entity for land use and transportation. How do we build capacity, or should we, at the regional level to combat these wicked problems? I think Larkin could talk about the local element. You might talk also about the regional. Yep, great question. Sure. Uh, so the, the approach that we're taking in Promised Neighborhoods is really being clear about a set of results uh, that we think all children in every Promised Neighborhood need to have. Um, and those results really span sectors. So they um, include some core educational outcomes like high school graduation and college graduation, but they also include outcomes like health and nutrition, um, like mobility, like um, the fact that all children need to feel safe in their school and in their neighborhood. Um, one local um, organization is not going to be able to move the needle on all those outcomes. So you can't use um, just one group or one funding stream. So we're really sort of setting the table with a, uh, a broad set of results. And um, our perspective is that um, uh, communities really need to come together and identify which organizations have the skills and have the capacity to improve all of those results for kids. Um, and that's really sort of a, a, a self-reflection that communities have to go through. Um, and through that process, they may find that there are some gaps. They may find some organizations that are doing well um, and those that aren't. Um, and communities really need to go through a process of making the tough decisions um, about how to fill those gaps. Um, and that may mean uh, you know, as Thomas alluded to before, actually stopping some programs that don't work, um, identifying those that do work and, and uh, expand them or take them to scale. Uh, so, so our approach, again, has really been to set um, a broad set of results uh, and challenge communities to really move them all in a collaborative way. Um, thanks. Um, Luke, could you speak a little bit to the regional mm -hmm. piece and maybe, you know, another HUD program that um, yeah. has received a lot of attention to sustainable communities <laughs> kind of also connects to this work. It, it, it absolutely does. Uh, you know, the truth is, uh, we're talking about neighborhoods here, but neighborhoods are always part of a larger context. Uh, and that larger context isn't just the city uh, that that neighborhood is located in. It's the metropolitan region. Uh, we know that in regions around the country, um, metropolitan areas like uh, the Denver metropolitan area, 
where mayors have gotten together uh, in suburbs uh, and then also uh, in the heart of the city uh, to work toward common goals, recognizing that the problems of one single neighborhood in that region really do impact uh, the people living throughout that region uh, and the availability uh, of housing uh, that a family can afford to put a roof over their head but not to have to drive then 40, 50 miles uh, to get to work uh, because that's the nearest job they can find. Uh, th those problems are problems that are felt throughout a region. And so what HUD has done in partnership with uh, the Department of Transportation uh, and EPA uh, is uh, advance the Sustainable Communities Initiative. Uh, what we're looking for is for communities around the country uh, to come together, uh, not just as one city uh, or as one uh, planning organization, uh, but to have a plan that uh, bridges uh, dist the distressed neighborhoods we're talking about today uh, and uh, economically uh, better off uh, parts of the city uh, and parts of the region. Uh, and those plans need to address uh, the entire set of needs for those, community, uh, for those communities, not just uh, where your homes are built, uh, but how you're connecting those homes to jobs, uh, to commercial opportunities uh, through transit uh, and your transportation planning. And so we're, we're very excited about some of the proposals that have come in. I think we're looking at a, a, a really a, a sea change in how communities do planning. Uh, we've got uh, all around the country uh, groups of uh, local mayors and uh, other planners who have come together uh, to, to try to advance in the sustain uh, sustainable communities uh, competition. Uh, and simply them coming together, uh, aside from the competition as a whole, uh, has been a, a huge shift. And we're, we're really, really excited about it. Thanks. And I would just mention we work with the uh, Sustainable Communities Partnership as well that it also uses a similar framework where it's connecting health. If you looked at the notice, right. they talked about connections to health. Yep. They talked about connections to open space, to arts and culture. They took a holistic approach to regional development, which is very consistent with a lot of the themes that the Neighborhood Revitalization Initiative is advancing. Mm -hmm. um, the next question I want to turn to, um, I'm going to direct this to Thomas. And it kind of goes back to the question we had about throwing money at the problem. It's kind of the reverse of that question. Um, this one comes from Carly Berwick in Jersey City, New Jersey. But Ben Adler from Washington, DC asked a similar question. Um, Carly's question, and this is a question from Next American City. My basic question is how small amounts of grant money can initiate widespread change. How do you see the process of a seed grant of like $500,000, which were the, the average size grants under Promised Neighborhoods? How do you see those leading to fundamental change in the fabric of American society, where we have recently seen the poor getting proportionally poorer and the wealthiest 1% becoming even richer? Uh, well, that's a, a great question, Carly. It's a, it's a big question. It's a difficult question. Um, I think that, uh, let me sort of start with the sort of uh, less good news and then go to the good news, which is that I think that one, th one issue we often fundamentally have is one of expectations. And I think that sometimes we have to be candid and, and really respect the complexity and scale of some of the challenges we face in certain distressed neighborhoods. These neighborhoods didn't become distressed uh, overnight and they won't change overnight. And so I think that in, in terms of that, it's important to set uh, expectations uh, realistically. And the reason I think that that's important is because you want to do this in a sustainable way. You want to do it over the long haul. If you overpromise, you fall short, and then you can't, and then you can't sort of continue to be de delivering. That said, small amounts of funding can do a lot, um, and they and they often um, have, and they often can leverage larger investments. We talked about this earlier, and I think that this is a real uh, sort of note of optimism, even in, in a difficult uh, fiscal climate and economic climate like we have right now. Uh, if you coordinate funding, if education deals with reduced funding, but uh, combines it and coordinates it with justice's funding, and we uh, do that with HUD's funding and HHS's funding, we can still make a difference for the distressed communities in the country. Uh, also, I think it's not just about uh, 
about coordinating, it's also about targeting. And that's what this place-based initiative is about. It's about knowing what specific places to work and how to do it and how to coordinate. Um, in, the, uh, in the criminal justice area, there's been a lot of innovative work done on something called hotspots policing, which says that basically uh, lo certain locations in neighborhoods, uh, say a, a, a neighborhood that's sort of challenged by crime generally, Crime isn't evenly spread over those neighborhoods. Often you'll see that four or five neighborhood uh, spots, a corner, a particular uh, club or a residence, create a huge, a huge amount of the crime in those neighborhoods. And so Hotspots Policing says, target your resources there. And that's a way to make funds go farther, do more with less. Now, we hope we don't have to do uh, more with less, but we have, to, we have to address these challenges. So I hope I've given sort of a balanced answer there, which is that I think we have to uh, be realistic in our expectations and be committed to addressing these problems over the long run, but that there really is uh, a lot we can do and a lot we hope to do, so there's reasons to be very helpful. Anyone want to add anything? Yeah, I mean, that's why we're here at this table, is because you know, there's, there's not uh, the kind of funding uh, that, you know, that folks have suggested in the questions to take on these problems. Uh, but it's really about using the funding that is available uh, more intelligently uh, in a more coordinated and collaborative way, and most important, more, more effectively. I mean, that's, that's why we're here, because as Larkin alluded to before, when you have departments broken down by silos and congressional committees broken down by silos and folks are working on the same problems but not talking to one another, um, you don't solve those problems with the investments that you're making. And the reason, uh, one of many, for the Neighborhood Revitalization Initiative is to make sure that the resources we're devoting uh, to these problems are solving those problems. And one thing I would just add is that when you look at the Neighborhood Revitalization Initiative, while we, the agencies have articulated some of the key programs that the group is working with, you shouldn't look at those as the only programs that are part of this initiative. In fact, um, the, the goal is to have these principles, this approach embedded throughout the entire agency so that the full suite of resources that an agency brings to bear are used to try and revitalize these communities in a more comprehensive, holistic fashion. Um, Secretary Donovan at HUD, when he talks about sustainable communities, often talks about how don't look at it, the budget for that is just the $150 million for the planning grant program. Look at it as the whole $44 billion budget for HUD, because we want to put those principles and direction in all of our programs. And I'm sure the same goes for neighborhood revitalization. Absolutely. And because this is a new initiative, there needs to be an incremental approach. These agencies are doing things in a way that's never been done before. It's unprecedented. And so they're trying to pick some areas to start the work with the purpose, the goal, the, the full intention of broadening that out to try and drive um, much greater and larger programs um, in their agencies and across the government. Um, Derek, I, I also just have to say that I think that um, the White House deserves some credit here in terms of sending us a consistent and strong signal to the agencies, uh, bringing us together around these initiatives consistently. Um, you know, uh, uh, you know, Richard, Larkin, Luke, and I, uh, we talk all the time. We're on, we're on email, we're working together, we're getting our various people, and that's really because of the consistent signal that Derek, the Domestic Policy Council, and the president have said, sent to us about, you need to work together, times are tough, we need to collaborate in order to keep, keep delivering. Great. Um, I want to turn now back to Luke with, um, there were some questions, because this was rolled out in the context of Promise, I'm sure there are some people watching today who have specific questions about um, that program. There was a question that came in from New American City, Next American City, um, from Josh McManus of Chattanooga, Tennessee. Um, he asked a series of questions, but I'll just ask you the first couple. His first was, how dependent on strong, well-defined community leadership were the decisions for the Promise Neighborhoods funding, so when you were evaluating them? And the second is, if one of the grantees does not fulfill the requirements of the planning grant, will the next stage of funding be reopened for additional applicants? 
Yeah, so those are actually pretty easy questions to answer um, uh, and, uh, and have pretty straightforward answers. So uh, how dependent on strong, well-defined leadership? So if you take a look at the, uh, at the point allocation um, for the program selection criteria, a quarter of the points were for project personnel. Um, so I think that that you know, sends a clear message that the program recognizes that uh, great leadership is really uh, a key part to the success of the program. Um, and in terms of your second question, if a, if a planning grantee doesn't fulfill their commitments, um, would, they, um, you know, would they not be eligible for implementation funding or, or would that be reopened? So we're very clear um, in the rules of the program that um, any organization that meets the eligibility requirements can apply for implementation funding. So receiving a planning grant is not at all a prerequisite for applying or receiving implementation funding. Uh, we do say, however, that communities who have gone through the planning process, um, whether they received a planning grant from the Department of Education or not, um, should have the plan uh, have the vision and the capacity uh, in place to really do the work successfully. But uh, we want to be perfectly clear that all communities um, are eligible for implementation grants, whether they received a planning grant or not. Great. Um, OK, the next question, this is a question that comes up a lot when you're doing um, this type of work. Again, it's from Next American City. The, and I'm going to direct it to you, Luke, to start. Mm -hmm. um, it's really about the impact when you revitalize communities, what impact that has on the people who were in the community beforehand and how do you address that. Um, the question is from Greg Scruggs. It says, the amenities that Promise Neighborhoods hopes to create are exactly the kind that are popular in increasingly expensive urban neighborhoods across America. How does the Neighborhood Revitalization Initiative plan to balance the inevitable rise in rents and property values with the financial means of existing residents. Could you talk about yeah. that, kind of some of the housing things? Absolutely. Uh, and you know, this is absolutely an important issue, but I think it's also important to put it in context. Nobody who lives on, uh, on a street where every second home is falling apart uh, or is being used, as I alluded to before, uh, by criminals because it's sitting vacant. Uh, nobody who lives on that street is hoping that that street's going to continue looking that way. None of us want to live on a street like that. Uh, it is vitally important when you're going to revitalize the neighborhood to ensure that uh, folks who live in that community, uh, who have homes in that community, uh, remain uh, the fabric of that community. And that's exactly what we're building into the Neighborhood Revitalization Initiative. Uh, there are two levels of responsibility here. Uh, there's a local level and there's a federal level. As we talked about before, for these efforts to succeed, they always, always, always have to be driven at the local level uh, by high capacity folks who know exactly what they're doing and are building plans that are responsive to the community members' needs. Uh, that's a responsibility uh, at the city council level, at the state level, at the mayor's office. Uh, there's also a federal responsibility. And that's why in programs like Choice Neighborhoods, uh, the HUD program that we've uh, talked about today, uh, we build in to the application process uh, an assessment of what that community is going to do to maintain affordability uh, for uh, the homes in that community, uh, to preserve the affordable housing, the HUD-assisted housing uh, in that community. And housing preservation, affordable housing preservation in general is always a challenge. It's one that has been a top priority for this administration uh, and one that we're uh, very happy to be working uh, with partners in Congress uh, on, on continuing to improve our ability to do that. Anyone want to add? Did you have any thoughts on this? I uh, no, all, all I can say is that, that it's something that we talked about, I mean, from our from day one, our beginning day meetings. That, I don't yeah. think we were 15 minutes into our first meeting yep. uh, before we talked about the importance of the people in the neighborhoods as well as the neighbor, you know. So I, I would just second what Lucas said. Yep. Um, Here's a quick question that, um, this is one that came in through our live chat from Pam Joshi. I could actually address this one. Um, it says, how is the White House office and the federal agencies' offices of faith-based and neighborhood partnerships participating in the federal neighborhood revitalization strategy? Um, Thomas mentioned, was, and was very gracious in mentioning the role that the White House has been playing in this initiative. Um, 
uh, myself on the Domestic Policy Council, and my colleagues on the Urban Affairs Office, Elena Beverly and others, um, to try and really serve as the um, facilitator bringing the agencies together to help drive um, the effort. Joshua Dubois, who is the head of the Office of Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships, is one of my colleagues on the Domestic Policy Council. And we have briefed him and talked to him about the Neighborhood Revitalization Initiative. And he and his team are also very engaged and interested in collaborating um, to make sure that the faith community and, and community-based organizations are um, aware of the initiative and engaged and become partners as we try and drive these um, issues and programs at the local level. Um, so thanks for that. I want to open another question up to the, to the group. Um, this is a question from a Angela Diane. This also came in from the live web chat. She asked, my biggest concern, my biggest question is how do we get the resources to the community level and ensure that communities are partnering to best utilize these resources? What kinds of cross-coordination will occur among federal agencies who have programs that can enhance awardees' opportunities to truly revitalize their community. This question about getting it to the community level as opposed to getting it stuck at the state or in government bureaucracies, I think, is an important one. Um, can some of you talk about your programs and how, I know Choice is a good example, how you're, you're revamping it to get it there. So who wants to start with that? Yes, I'll start from the Promise Neighborhood perspective, the, the funds do flow right to the community. So, so you're only eligible for funding if you are um, uh, either a nonprofit or an institution of higher education that is based in the community. So there's a clear requirement for community representation in the governing board and the advisory board um, that ultimately is going to determine what that program looks like. Um, so we, we believe, really believe strongly that communities are really best positioned to drive this work. Um, it was alluded to before and uh, what was a harder question than I got that Luke I think answered really well, which is this idea um, that this work is, should never be done to a community. It should be done with and by a community. Um, and, uh, and so Promise Neighborhoods will really maintain that focus um, and ensure that the communities are front and center uh, in making the tough decisions to improve outcomes for kids and neighborhoods. Um, Larkin, do you want to just maybe mention the uh, the advisory boards? Sure. Uh, because I know this this is something that you and I have talked about right. in terms of coordination. Yep. Yep. So so as we think about how a Promise Neighborhood program would relate to a weed and seed or what is now uh, burn criminal justice, we really want to ensure that that the that the governing structure not only aligns so that we're not forcing communities to create new levels of bureaucracy, but also that there uh, is really strong community representation um, at the table um, at those advisory boards and governing boards. So again, the communities are really the ones that, that uh, are driving the decisions, that they're not just um, you know, holding you know, a position or a seat or two on a board, but they're actually representing the majority of the decision makers. Let me, let me give an example. Um, yeah. HHS is uh, jumping into this. Um, uh, we're expanding and strengthening our community health centers across the country. And mm -hmm. um, in the coming five years, we're uh, going to invest about $9.5 billion uh, at uh, centers uh, that are sited in medically underserved <coughs> areas. Now, as part of the Neighborhood Revitalization Initiative, we're encouraging local partnerships between existing and new community health centers and Promise Neighborhoods, Choice Neighborhoods, burn criminal justice programs, uh, and we want to consider a variety of other ways to get community health centers more involved in the fabric of all these changes. So for example, um, uh, in its uh, uh, applications uh, uh, for new access points uh, under community, uh, for community health centers, our health services resource uh, uh, administration has asked uh, applicants to describe their efforts to coordinate their activities with promise, with choice, with burn, uh, as really a mechanism for telling us uh, how they're going to uh, be creative, how they're going to be innovative, and that will actually affect our evaluation of their applications. I just want to add one piece to illustrate uh, what Larkin was saying. 
earlier about uh, this uh, neighborhood revitalization initiative, uh, neighborhood revitalization initiative being catalytic. Uh, you know, part of uh, an element that we built into many of the programs uh, that we're talking about here uh, is uh, an incentive for local communities to make sometimes difficult political choices uh, to target block grant funding that would otherwise, uh, at the state level or at the local level, um, perhaps not be as often targeted uh, to a particular problem or, or community. Uh, and we've built in the incentives in these programs uh, for folks to do that. So it's not just within the programs that we're talking about here, but larger block grant funds like CDBG um, where, or the health centers where there really is an incentive, uh, as Richard talked about, uh, to focus uh, that investment. Great. Um, so I want to turn back to a question from the, that came in from Next American City. And I will um, I'll open this up. But um, the question comes from Vanessa Francis in Silver Spring, Maryland. And she asks, will the initiative, the Neighborhood Revitalization Initiative, engage subject matter experts that can contribute to successful outcomes, particularly, particularly in areas of recreational, physical aspects of community development. And she listed as examples the American Planning Association, the Congress on New Urbanism, Landscape Architects, et cetera. I was wondering if one of you wanted to talk about that convening we held um, with the outside experts in our neighborhood revitalization group to help us inform the work and get different input. Does anyone want to address that? Or do you want me to? <laughs> <laughs> you can talk about it. You yeah. it. Yeah. OK. Uh, you all are supposed to be the experts. <laughs> I'm just supposed to be the host. Um, the, the short answer to that question is definitely yes. And in fact, the, um, the product that you're seeing that was rolled out on September 21st that we're talking about today was actually informed and, um, and is a result of several meetings and convenings and collaborations with outside experts in the field, many of them from the organizations that you listed, to help us better understand what are the best ways to truly um, revitalize neighborhoods, high poverty neighborhoods, neighborhoods with severe economic distress. Um, last year, we held an urban policy roundtable where we brought in 30 or 35 national experts from around the country who came in, who had worked on these issues for decades, many of them, who helped us get a roadmap, roadmap actually helped us start thinking about um, what the neighborhood revitalization concept is, this notion of comprehensive community development, how you need to embed responsible redevelopment principles in the work, um, which directly led to some of the things that you saw. We then later followed that up with the convening that included, we had US attorneys, and we had planners, developers, folks from the lending, CDFIs, which are community development financial institutions, um, health centers, a whole range of folks who came in to specifically give more feedback on the initiative. And we rely heavily on the, the, the advice and, and guidance from outside subject matter experts, people from nonprofits and grassroots organizations who do this work every day. The president often talks about his approach to policy making as being bottoms up, mm -hmm. as the best ideas coming from outside of Washington. So we take that to heart, literally, and bring people in to help us guide and, and inform our policy development processes. And I expect that we will continue to do that work. And I know if you ask, they could talk about their individual programs that relate to neighborhood revitalization, but I'm sure in each instance, mm -hmm. There were several convenings and um, um, collaborations with outside experts to help them design what the program ultimately looked like. So we have um, time for one last question um, or last set of comments. The, the question I'll end with is one from Catherine Timko. This is a question that came in from the, the um, the live chat, um, and she asks, is there a priority structure for communities and or zip codes that have some of the most challenging metrics? Um, and she lists as examples cities like Detroit, Network, Newark, Cleveland, Miami. Um, some of these are the most economically distressed communities in the country. Um, 
What is the priority structure for addressing those in your programs and in the initiative more broadly? I mean, just say that you know every every program is a little bit different, uh, but what we're looking to do is is really meet communities where they are. Clearly, if you're talking about making a, a catalytic investment in a community uh, that's distressed, you're going to be looking at the need, the need in that community uh, in terms of poverty, in terms of housing, in terms of educational opportunities. Um, but you're also looking at the capacity uh, of, of the grantees. And, and part of what uh, we're trying to do at the federal level uh, is uh, look at the very best, uh, most promising practices from all around the country, say that this is what everybody has to shoot for, uh, and really hold that standard out there uh, so that in community after community around the country, uh, folks can develop the capacity, uh, be really rigorous uh, about their planning, uh, and, and come forward with um, plans that work. Um, yeah, we in HHS word. this year um, uh, have mounted a, uh, a sort of a proof of concept uh, grant program that's really directly targeted at some of the most distressed communities. It's called Community Resilience and Recovery Initiative, uh, which uses a place-based strategy to implement sort of multiple uh, evidence-based interventions uh, for distressed communities aimed at um, uh, cushioning the blows uh, of that distress on the uh, uh, behavioral health of a community. And uh, towards the end of this week, um, uh, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration is going to announce its first set of grants of up, uh, of up to five communities uh, that are particularly distressed to start to implement this program. And uh, that really is a key to our targeting strategy here. Thanks, Richard. And with that, Richard, you'll have the last word. Let me just, in closing, thank our partner, Next American City, for the questions and for um, um, the collaboration on this live web chat. I want to thank all the viewers who stayed with us for the hour to watch and listen and learn more about the Neighborhood Revitalization Initiative. If you want more information, you can go to our website at www.whitehouse.gov. And if you go to the Urban Affairs webpage, you can get a detailed description of the initiative and how we plan to move forward. Um, with that, thank you for joining us.